needed, but meant to be thinking about how we are both continuing, um, but also building on the work of, of the White House Council. So if you know it all, sort of how the White House Council on um, Women and Girls works, it is sort of internally focused towards um, White House policy, right? Excuse me, uh, towards government policy, right? So. Uh, um, the, the effort that is kind of the My Brother's Keeper effort that is kind of splashy and externally focused, programmatically focused, is all very external um, and largely kind of corporate um, and is meant to reside primarily in um, community-based organizations that are doing work with, um, with families, with neighborhoods, with church-based groups, that sort of thing. Um, but the White House Council of Women and Girls was actually formed very early on in the administration and is more policy oriented. And it's, it's really focused towards um, every part of the bureaucracy having to ask the question for each and every um, policy initiative, how does it, in fact, infl influence girls? How does it influence women? Um, so that the Department of Transportation or Homeland Security or anything else must, in fact, be thinking about questions of gender, even um, as they are doing the work of engaging in presumably gender neutral policy making. So in that way, um, might actually be thought of as more impactful, but also um, more obscure um, from, um, from view. So we're not exactly an arm of the White House in that sense. Um, we did get uh, an opportunity to throw a great party at the White House in the sense of having had this big uh, research, um, you yeah, know, a big nerd party, right, uh, IEA mm -hmm. conference there in November. Um, but the idea was to bring together a group of research institutions um, and by research institutions, we mean both um, universities, um, as, or not just both, but I guess universities, colleges, but also think tanks, also community-based organizations. Um, we also have some presses um, that are part of what we do, so now women's foundations, uh, but folks who are committed to doing research in a variety of different ways, who are actually making financial commitments, not to some pot of money in the middle, but rather at their own institutions, same with the support that that's the collaborative to advance equity. Um, and what the Energy Lee Cooper Center has said is that over the course of the next five years, we will help provide some administrative um, support, impetus, focus, um, emails, um, to make sure that we are staying in communication um, with one another as we do this work so that we can amplify it, uplift it, and, uh, and make sure that we're working in fact in collaboration. And that is largely the role that, um, that Sarah is playing in relation to in to a variety of other roles at AJC. Then the Energy Lee Cooper Center is also doing another big effort that we probably hold a little bit more centrally, and that is um, a project we're calling the IRA. I think it's not the last uh, <laughs> It is the Intersexual Research Agenda. Um, and this effort is um, us trying to think about if we were developing a research agenda for the next decade, if we were saying, uh, basically three questions. What do we know about women and girls of color? What do we need to know about women and girls of color and women deficits? And what would be the relationships and resources that we need to bring to bear in order to respond to the deficits and not what would they be? Um, those three questions animating kind of a big agenda. And so part of what we're doing around the IRA are these communities bringing together sometimes collaborative partners, sometimes folks that aren't necessarily collaborative, um, to just start having a set of conversations to ask what do we need to know, what do we currently know, what is the state of the research, and hopefully both um, for the Energy and Cooper Center, but also for all of our partners, really just start getting this conversation going. I'll just tell you, sort of, we have some deliverables that we have in mind that are very concrete, but even more than the concrete ones, it's the ways that we expect, hopefully, that, um, that we can start to intervene in a kind of intellectual zeitgeist. Um, the example I'd like to use here is what happened with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, started providing these extraordinary fellowships for social scientists, right? Um, these postdoctoral fellowships for social scientists at you know, these four or five different institutions. And all of a sudden, political scientists were like, hmm, how does my research have something to do with public health, right? Or economists who had never particularly thought about public health were like, oh yeah, I bet this has something to do with that. 
And it was just a, you know, it was a little carrot that existed in the world, not a little one, maybe a mid-sized carrot, but it actually shifted a whole generation of social scientific researchers and, and along with them, um, so not just, not just the book actually got the postdocs, right, but publication opportunities, what we thought of as reasonable questions to ask them in these fields. So we're hoping that something similar happens around the men and girls of color. But if we can kind of shift some of the incentive structures, create some new resource opportunities at top universities, generate some new spaces for conversation, that people might start asking, hmm, yeah, I do some of this work, but what if I asked it about AAPI women? What if I asked it about um, African American girls living in um, uh, marginal communities um, in the South? What if I asked that actually about um, Latinos living in poorer communities? Um, if we in fact started asking questions in that way, how might that shift sort of field in ways that we don't even necessarily, can't even necessarily see? Um, so that's kind of our So, with that said, I'd love to just kind of get a, a sense of who's at the table a little bit and, and we'll get into some of our um, questions. I know we have bios, so I'm just going to kind of time. But um, I'd love actually to start with, with you, Kim. Um, uh, both of you would love to start in the middle of the table, if you start with the center, and also because um, you are, I would always think of you as representative of Wake Forest University. Um, and so, uh, Kim, I, I'd love to start with you and then uh, head up to Mark. My name is Kimberly Quick. I am a policy associate at the Century Foundation. Um, most of my work deals with um, studying and learning about educational access and equity. Um, Howie Potter, my colleague Peter, and I just um, released a report about the growth of districts that are employing and of course socioeconomic integration. Um, and it was prepared for a report from a researcher at um, Teachers College Columbia that talked about sort of the benefits of diverse classrooms in diverse school settings. Um, and so we are very interested in sort of infusing questions of race, identity, and gender into the research that we currently do. Um, Melissa pointed out that I am a Wake Forest graduate. Um, I spent a year um, after graduation working in the provost office as a senior fellow there. Um, where mainly I worked on diversity and inclusion work, but um, kind of had a hand in a number of different areas there as well. Um, some of the research that we're really excited about delving into the with women and girls of color specifically um, is, or at least on, on my part, um, I'd really like to look at um, the effectiveness of pipeline programs and then introducing the women and girls of color in the areas where they're kind of working at their um, specifically, I'm looking at the areas of um, STEM fields where women and girls of color, two-thirds of young girls of color express interest in STEM fields, but about one-tenth of employee scientists and engineers are actually underrepresented in women and girls of color. Um, same in the fields of law and business. Um, for instance, almost half, about 47% of women um, are or of law school and relates are women. Um, same percentage or approximately the same percentage with first year associates, um, but women are far less likely to re remain in the field of law. Um, and women in general are about 70% partners, and people of color of any gender are about 4% of partners. And so when we look at women of color, we know that that is much lower than those employees. Um, and the third area is politics, um, which clearly has civic consequences, consequences in our discourse, um, as well as just consequences in general representation. So we're really excited to talk about this. Is that too much? No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Scarlett will introduce me. Marie Bragg, I'm an assistant professor here at the 
Eagle Public Health, and um, my research mostly focuses on racially targeted food and beverage marketing. So we know that campaigns like the um, Five Day Food and Vegetable Consumption, the largest budget it ever had was in the millions. And food and beverage companies like Coke and McDonald's and Pepsi have budgets in the billions for advertising. And we know that they're now spending uh, huge portions of that on communities of color. So one of the things that excited me about uh, this meeting was the opportunity to talk about some of the studies that we have looking at um, studies, you know, looking at social media accounts where brands owned by the same companies um, have very different demographic targets. So how many people have heard of the brand Coke Life? It's like the new healthy Coke that's past media, past nature. If you look at their Instagram page, for example, um, it's mostly white women uh, eating salad uh, on the beach. Uh, <laughs> and yoga. And, uh, and that, that's um, one of the content analysis themes that we grew up and that's a lower calorie soda. And if you go to Sprite's Instagram page, same company that owns it, um, it's mostly um, African American adolescents. Uh, and so we see a very sharp contrast in the target demographic of two brands owned by the very same company. And, uh, and so that's one aspect of the work that we do. Um, we're also looking at um, whether or not um, adolescents of color respond differently to the ads that show people of their demographic group. And there, we can all hypothesize a variety of reasons why that might be the case. Um, and so we're basically modeling after the tobacco. Um, Shriki Kimanika from Penn has done a lot of work on outdoor advertising and target different um, uh, race, racial ethnic groups. And so we're expanding that to um, 